in what way do you think these large language models and the thing they give birth to in the AI space will change this human experience, the human condition? The things we've talked across many podcasts about that makes life so damn interesting and rich, love, fear, fear of death, all of it. Uh, if we could just begin kind of thinking about how does it change for the good and the bad, the human condition. Human society is extremely complicated. We have come from a hunter-gatherer society to an agricultural and farming society where the goal of most professions was to eat and to survive. And with the advent of agriculture, the ability to live together in societies, humans could suddenly be valued for different skills. If you don't know how to hunt, but you're an amazing potterer, then you fit in society very well because you can sort of make your pottery and you can barter it for rabbits that somebody else caught. And the person who hunts the rabbits doesn't need to make pots because you're making all the pots. And that specialization of humans is what shaped modern society. And with the advent of currencies and governments and you know credit cards and Bitcoin, you basically now have the ability to exchange value for the kind of productivity that you have. So basically I make things that are desirable to others, I can sell them and buy back food, shelter, et cetera. With AI, the concept of I am my profession might need to be revised because I defined my profession in the first place as something that humanity needed that I was uniquely capable of delivering. Mm -hmm. But the moment we have AI systems able to deliver these goods, for example, writing a piece of software or making a self-driving car or interpreting the human genome, then that frees up more of human time for other pursuits. Mm -hmm. This could be pursuits that are still valuable to society. I could basically be 10 times more productive at interpreting genomes and do a lot more. Or I could basically say, oh great, the interpreting genomes part of my job now only takes me 5% of the time instead of 60% of the time. So now I can do more creative things. I can explore not new career options, but maybe new directions for my research lab. Mm -hmm. I can sort of be more productive, contribute more to society. And if you look at this giant pyramid that we have built on top of the subsistence economy, what fraction of US jobs are going to feeding all of the US? Less than 2%. Basically, the, the, the gain in productivity is such that 98% of the economy is beyond just feeding ourselves. And that basically means that we kind of have built this system of interdependencies of needed or useful or valued goods that sort of make the economy run, that the vast majority of wealth goes to other, what we now call needs, but used to be wants. Mm -hmm. So basically, I want to fly a drone, I want to buy a bicycle, I want to buy a nice car, I want to have a nice home, I want to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and then sort of, what is my direct contribution to my eating? I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing research on the human genome. I mean, this will help humans, it will help all of humanity. But how is that helping the person who's giving me poultry or mm -hmm. <laughs> vegetables? So in a way, I see AI as perhaps leading to a dramatic rethinking of human society. If you think about sort of the economy being based on intellectual goods that I'm producing, what if AI can produce a lot of these intellectual goods and satisfies that need? Does that now free humans for more artistic expression, for more emotional maturing, for basically having a better work-life balance, mm -hmm. being able to show up for your two hours of work a day or two hours of work like three times a week with like immense rest and preparation and exercise and you're sort of clearing your mind and suddenly you have these two amazingly creative hours. 
You basically show up at the office as your AI is busy answering your phone call, making all your meetings, you know, revising all your papers, et cetera. And then you show up for those creative hours and you're like, all right, autopilot, I'm on. Mm -hmm. And then you can basically do so, so much more that you would perhaps otherwise never get to because you're so overwhelmed with these mundane aspects of your, of your job. So I feel that AI can truly transform the human condition from realizing that we don't have jobs anymore. We now have vocations. And there's this beautiful analogy of uh, three people laying bricks. And somebody comes over and asks the first one, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm laying bricks. Second one, what are you doing? I'm building a wall. And the third one, what are you doing? I'm building this beautiful cathedral. So in a way, the first one has a job, the last one has a vocation. And if you ask me, what are you doing? Oh, I'm editing a paper, then I have a job. What are you doing? I'm understanding human disease circuitry. I have a vocation. Mm -hmm. So in a way, being able to allow us to enjoy more of our vocation by taking away, offloading some of the job part of our daily activities. So we all become the, the builders of cathedrals. Correct. <sighs> yeah, and we follow intellectual pursuits, artistic pursuits. I wonder what, how that really changes at a scale of several billion people, everybody playing in the space of ideas, in the space of creations. So ideas, maybe for some of us, maybe you and I are in the job of ideas, but other people are in the job of experiences. Other job, are other people in the, the job of emotions, of dancing, of creative artistic expression, of you know skydiving and you name it. So basically these, again, the beauty of human diversity is exactly that, that what rocks my boat might be very different from what rocks other people's boat. And what I'm trying to say is that maybe AI will allow humans to truly like not just look for, but find meaning. And sort of, you don't need to work, mm -hmm. but you need to keep your brain at ease. And the way that your brain will be at ease is by dancing and creating these amazing, you know, movements or creating these amazing paintings or creating, I don't know, something that, that sort of changes, that, that touches at least one person out there that sort of shapes humanity through that process. And instead of working your, you know, mundane programming job where you like hate your boss and you hate your job and you say, you hate that darn program, et cetera. You're like, well, I don't need that. I can, you know, offload that. And I can now explore something that will actually be more beneficial to, huma to humanity because the mundane parts can be offloaded. I wonder if it localizes our, uh, all the things you've mentioned, all the vocations. So, you mentioned that you and I might be playing in the space of ideas, but there's two ways to play in the space mm -hmm. of ideas, both of which we're currently engaging mm -hmm. in. So one is the communication of that to other people. It could be a classroom full of students, but it could be a podcast. It could be something that's uh, that's shown on YouTube and so on. Or it could be just the act of sitting alone and playing with ideas in your head, or maybe with a loved one, having a conversation that nobody gets to see. Yeah. The experience of just sort of looking up at the sky and wondering uh, different things, maybe quoting some philosophers from the past and playing with those little ideas. And that little exchange is forgotten forever, but you got to experience it. And maybe we will, I wonder if it localizes that exchange of ideas, but that with AI, it'll become less and less valuable to communicate with a large group of people, that you will live life intimately and, and richly just with that circle of, meat bags that you seem to love? So the first is, even if you're alone in a forest, having this amazing thought, when you exit that forest, the baggage that you carry has been shifted, mm -hmm. has been altered by that thought. When I bike to work in the morning, I listen to books and I'm alone. No one else is there. I'm having that experience by myself and yet, in the evening when I speak with someone, an idea that was formed there could come back. Sometimes when I fall asleep, I fall asleep listening to a book. Yeah. And in the morning, I'll be full of ideas that I never even process consciously. I'll process them unconsciously. And they will shape that baggage that I carry, 
that will then shape my interactions and again, affect ultimately all of humanity in some butterfly effect, minute kind of way. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is gatherings. So basically you and I are having a conversation which feels very private, mm -hmm. but we're sharing with the world. And then later tonight, you're coming over mm -hmm. and we're having a conversation that will be very public with dozens of other people, but we will not share with the world. Yeah. <laughs> so in a way, which one's more private? The one here or the one there? Here, there's just two of us, but a lot of others listening. There, a lot of people speaking and thinking together and bouncing off each other. And maybe that will then impact your millions of, you know, uh, of audience mm -hmm. through your next conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the beauty of humanity. The fact that no matter how small, how alone, how broadcast immediately or later on something is, it still percolates through the human psyche. Human gatherings. All throughout human history, there's been gatherings. I, I wonder how those gatherings have impacted the direction of human civilization. Just uh, thinking of in the early days of the Nazi party, it was a small collection of people gathering. And the uh, the kernel of an idea, in that case an evil idea, uh, gave birth to something that actually had a transformative impact on all of human civilization. And then there's similar kind of gatherings that lead to positive transformations. 